Okay, so let's review the types of inflammation. Uh, this is in chapter six of your textbook. So just to recap again, uh, hopefully you've been able to watch the uh, short video on the actual inflammatory response, but generally inflammation is really there to protect the body. The body recognizes that there's some kind of an insult, whether that's bacteria or whether you've had a cut or some kind of cellular injury. It tries to stop it from getting worse and tries to repair it. And sometimes the process can become uncontrollable, and so the very system that was designed to heal the body actually harms it. But inflammation by itself has several benefits. It really prevents infection and further damage, and it interacts with um, and prepares the injured area for healing and repair. Now, only living tissue can really elicit uh, an inflammatory response. If the tissue is already dead, it cannot become inflamed. This is why many times body parts that become gangrenous need to be amputated. They get infected, the body cannot fight the localized infection. Inflammation by itself is really a nonspecific response to any offending agent or insult or injury to the cell, tissue, or the body. It can be chemical, physical, microbial. The response is the same no matter what caused the injury. The outcome, though, depends on the extent of the damage and how long the inflammatory response actually lasts. So um, this video, again, just shows, uh, it's just sort of a pictorial of um, what the end product of the inflammatory response is. Um, you know, there's some kind of cellular injury or um, some kind of, you know, invasion of bacteria. There is activation of these cellular processes that include mast cell degranulation um, through the release of histamine. There's activation of these plasma systems, which is the complement and clotting cascade and kinin systems, and there's a release of cellular products, which are all of the cellular mediators. Uh, those all together, um, they are interdependent of each other, so sometimes one will cause activation of another and s vice versa. Uh, they all produce these cardinal signs of inflammation, which are heat, redness, swelling, and pain. They do that by causing vasodilation, um, increasing vascular permeability, which leads to edema. Uh, cellular infiltration of, you know, macro macrophages usually, um, clots, clot formation or thrombosis formation, and certainly pain, um, usually due to the um, bradykinin system. So the exudate that is produced um, by the inflammatory response varies in composition depending on the stage of inflammation, how long the process lasts, and to some extent the nature of the initial stimulus. So let's look at some different types of inflammation. So the first one is serous inflammation. This is the mildest form of inflammation. And what you see here is a very serous exudate. This is uh, really an exudate that contains protein and albumin mostly. It's usually clear. It's kind of like the serum of your blood. It occurs very early in, in the inflammatory process. Uh, can be typical of viral infections. Really, there's no bacteria there, so there's nothing for um, macrophages to invade and eat up. So you see this typically on the skin. This happens to be uh, from a, a sunburn. Um, you see the vesicles or blisters that form. Um, inside the body cavity, however, you can have serous inflammation, which is really a collection of fluid. It can be yellowish or clear, um, and it seeps into uh, organs and tissues or spaces like the, um, uh, the peritoneum, uh, which is the lining of the abdominal organ, or you see this typically in a joint. Um, you might see um, like a swelling inside a joint, so the synovial membrane uh, becomes inflamed, and there is a large amount of serous inflammation that occurs there. Now, serous inflammation can be very painful uh, because there's a lot of nerve endings generally in the organs where you have serous inflammation, and those nerve endings really get irritated. And swelling um, as the fluid seeps into the extracellular space, and you get redness because there is an increased blood flow to the area. Again, this is really the initial phase of inflammation. You can also have serosanguinous uh, inflammation, which is really expected with trauma to blood vessels, or you can have sanguinous inflammation, which is really just um, more of a blood blood inflammation. If the um, inflammation is uh, limited, the body can reabsorb the serous inflammation and many times treatments that we use to target serous inflammation can help, such as cold therapy um, and some of our anti-inflammatories like our NSAIDs. Uh, one of our favorites is ibuprofen. Uh, a more difficult type of inflammation or a more uh, challenging type of inflammation to deal with, to, uh, to deal with for the body to deal with is uh, something called fibrinous inflammation. So what you have in fibrinous, uh, what 
inflammation is really this characteristic exudate that's rich in fibrin. And fibrin is really large proteins that are responsible for blood clotting. This is usually a sign of a larger inflammatory process where now actual plasma has leaked into the damaged tissue, which contains the fibrin that form clots. The exudate by itself is generally thin and yellowish, but can also be pink tinged or serosanguinous. Um, Blood vessels actually grow into the exudate, usually to provide a pathway for more macrophages to come to the affected area. This allows uh, also a way for debris to be removed. So what you see here are two types particular examples of fibrinous inflammation. Here on the left side you have fibrinous inflammation of the pericardial sac. The pericardium is normally a glossy, has a glossy finish to it, but now you can see this sticky fibrinous um, material. This is a pericarditis and very difficult to treat. This is something that is usually viral in nature, but because there was so much inflammation, there was so much fibrin that leaked into this pericardial space, um, you typically last about two to six weeks. Um, and this can become, pericarditis can actually become a chronic problem for patients. What you see over here on the right is a group A beta strep. Um, probably many of you are familiar with having had strep throat uh, throughout your um, lifetime. Uh, you see here purulent um, fibrinous exudate where again you have had a large amount of bacteria. The body has tried to invade that bacteria and eat it so you have a ton of macrophages trying to lyse that bacteria and phagocytize that bacteria and what happens is that bacteria dies and that is left, you're left now with the body trying to clean up that mess and you get this very fibrinous um, uh, purulent looking, uh, these white spots here. Um, now True purulent inflammation um, is really a viscous fluid that's full of dead and dying neutrophils and necrotic tissue. So leukocytes are going to migrate from the bloodstream into the tissue to fight bacteria. So you generally see this when you have a bacterial infection. Now when pus accumulates in an organ or tissue, that creates something called an abscess, as you see here in this kidney. Uh, when that, th This is a chronic problem. The abscess by itself, where the bacteria gets into the um, organ and the macrophages that leak into that area try to um, kill off the bacteria. Um, there, the abscess itself forms a fibrous capsule. So the healthy tissue fuses to the abscess to keep neighboring tissues from being infected. But then the pus is walled off and the leukocytes can't get there and the treatment becomes much harder. So abs abscesses by themselves do not heal on their own. They usually require um, Large, antibi large, large amounts of antibiotics and, and generally sometimes surgical excision. You might have a wound that requires an incision and drainage where the wound will have to be opened up and literally drained. They wash it out with saline usually and then they will pack the wound. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about wound healing because typically wounds uh, that have, uh, have had an abscess <clears throat> and require surgical IND generally will heal by secondary intention. What you see here on the right side is actually a fistula. A uh, fistula is a channel that forms between two hollow cavities uh, or organs, um, or between a hollow organ and a cavity. So sometimes, for example, loops of bowel may fuse together as a result of inflammation, and the cells create an opening or hole, which allows pus and intestinal contents to pass. This happens to be a fistula between the pleural cavity around the lung and the outside. Um, but what you see here is, um, has a, originally you had <clears throat> a um, a patient who had a pneumonectomy had their lung resected and uh, there was pus in that cavity. Um, pus inside the cavity is considered to be an empyema and um, this requires uh, a great deal of incision and drainage as well and there's a lot of um, treatment for this usually depends on uh, the cause and the um, extent of the fistula, the cause of this particular aspergilla, um, this particular empyema was aspergillus. Uh, with this is ulcerative inflammation. Um, what you, what's very characteristic about ulcerative inflammation is the loss of epithelial lining of body surfaces or of mucosal lining of hollow organs, such as the stomach. So you see here is a colon. Um, may extend into connective tissue underneath the epithelial layer. You see this is a wound from venous insufficiency, this uh, sort of meaty uh, wound where the epithelium has been eaten away. And what you have is exposed um, connective tissue underneath that epithelial, epithelial layer that is gone. You, you generally have an exudate um, 
the treatment for this really focuses on prevention of infection, reduction of the edema, and removal of that exudate, and of course easing pain. These are very, ulcerative inflammation is very painful due to the nerve endings and the tissue being inflamed or damaged. Uh, this does take a long time to heal. Ulcers unfortunately can become chronic, and so when patients have poor circulation, such as those with venous insufficiency, um, these ulcers will take a, a long time to heal. You have pseudomembranous inflammation, which is actually sort of a combination of ulcerative inflammation accompanied by a purulent exudate. So whereas before in ulcerative inflammation, you have a non-purulent exudate, just a simple serous exudate. Here you actually have a purulent exudate that accompanies that ulcerative inflammation. And so what happens is there, um, that, that purulent exudate, again, contains fibrin and cellular debris because there was probably bacteria there at one point that was killed off by the macrophages and the other phagocytic cells that need to take care of it. And because of that, you sort of get this creation of what's called a false membrane on top of the mucosal lining. So here in the, in the GI tract, this is one particular place this happens quite frequently, many times this is caused by bacterial infections with potent endotoxins which kill off the mucosal layer and some tissue below. So the bacteria themselves create an endotoxin and it is the endotoxin that is left after the bacteria die that actually degrade the um, colon lining. So the inflammatory response brings fibrin that coats this sort of disrupted area, which brings plasma that's rich in leukocytes to try and kill that bacteria to cause pus. So now if the membrane is actually stripped, scraped, scraped off, if you were actually to scrape it off, it really just looks like ulcerative inflammation underneath this false membrane. Very characteristic in thrush over on this side, but also uh, here you have C. diff colitis where the C. diff is the primary culprit. Um, and so C. diff is very, very challenging to get rid of. It usually comes from antibiotic. Um, it's usually an antibiotic resistant problem or can be. Um, so patients can, can have a large amount of dehydration because what happens is the colon gets extremely inflamed and there tends to be frequent watery stools. So, um, so this is C. diff is a form of pseudomembranous colitis. And finally, you have granulomatous inflammation. Uh, gran you, you see granulomatous inflammation only really in chronic inflammatory responses. So this can be infectious, such as, for example, uh, TB, or can be a result of hypersensitivity reaction, such as um, from an immune response, such as Crohn's disease. These are tightly packed collections of macrophages. They may or may not contain necrosis, right? So um, again, if those granulomas were to be cut off or taken off, um, you, you may or may not see uh, nec necrosis underneath it. But in an inflammatory response, neutrophils are the first responder to the site of infection. So granulomas form when the neutrophils fail to kill the pathogen. Large amount of macrophages are needed, so um, the, they kind of um, circulate the body in the form of a monocyte and they morph into a macrophage when they enter the tissue. They are a little bit stronger and larger and live longer than a neutrophil. So as the neutrophils have come to the site to try to kill that, they have failed to do so. This is a continuous chronic problem. And so now you have all these macrophages that are trying to come and clean the mess up. So what happens is now you have macrophages trying to not only kill the bacteria, but also dealing with the dead and decaying neutrophils that are there. These um, actually get walled off and uh, attached to the membrane. So they sort of destroy the surrounding tissue where they get, where they form. And, you know, in uh, previous um, lectures, you learned about cassius necrosis. Well, cassius necrosis is what happens in t lungs that, um, from TB. So again, this granulomatous process starts in TB. This happens to be a colon. So this is what the typical or characteristic colon lining of those with Crohn's disease can look like.